Hi, I'm Bruce and welcome to the Baptronics Mountain Labs. And uh, what we're looking at today is a uh, Hewlett Packard 5328A Universal Counter. This counter debuted probably about 1975 and at the time was uh, quite an impressive instrument. Actually still is quite an impressive instrument. I won't knock it down. But uh, was introduced uh, as a base model in order to keep the cost lower. It had a slew of options that extended its uh, capabilities. In its base form, you had the counter unit and you had uh, two channels, A and B. Channel A was the primary measurement point uh, for frequency. You could measure from 0 to 100 megahertz. Had some uh, uh, attenuation and um, uh, slope choices and these coupling and so on for um, configuring the signal. And then uh, channel B was primarily to uh, uh, use to provide a, a means to enhance functionality with channel A. Yeah, we'll kind of get into that in a minute, but. Um, um, the base unit could measure frequency uh, 0 to 100 megahertz, could measure period from uh, uh, on frequencies from 0 to 10 megahertz as far as the rating went. Uh, you could uh, do period averaging where you would uh, average the, uh, the period counts over uh, multiple periods. You could select it using your uh, uh, resolution control. We'll demonstrate that. Then you could uh, measure the ratio of channel B to channel A. So now you begin to understand uh, how it, channel B is used to enhance functionality but not really directly measure the frequency of B alone. It involved uh, comparing B to A. So say channel B had 10 megahertz and channel A had 5, then you would get a ratio of 2. You could measure time intervals uh, from A to B. Um, if channel A would would have a pulse going in on it uh, that that went high, that would trigger the uh, the count of microseconds on the uh, on the counter, and it would keep counting until channel B would step high, at which point it would shut down, and and then you would show your count. Um, this would be like uh, measuring the time interval, say, between. Uh, um, Oh, I, you could say from the time you shot a gun till the time that the bullet uh, hit the uh, object across the room. Uh, if you had the right sensors set up and, uh, and you triggered channel A at the moment that the gun blasted and you could measure the, the bullet travel time, say, till uh, uh, channel B uh, went high and then it stopped. And uh, you can average the uh, the time intervals from A to B if it's uh, re repetitive, and then you'll increase your uh, your accuracy of that time average. Um, if you have, then there was options that you can add that uh, gave you other functionality. Uh, there was a voltmeter that you could have had in here. Uh, I believe it converted voltage to frequency and displayed it, but it, anyway. There's a channel C that, uh, an option 30, that extended your range more than five times. Uh, this happens to have that option 30. So this unit can measure up to 512 megahertz. So five times the range. And if you have channel C, then you can measure frequency on C. You can do the ratio of C to A. So A will enhance C just like B enhanced A. And uh, there's a counter that you can start counting on A and then you can stop counting. And there's a check function where uh, you can, uh, it applies a 10 megahertz signal to the incoming channel and then you can just step through on this uh, resolution switch. And for every step you'll see a different decade of the count but you should display 10, 10 million in each of its forms. At the time that I got it, this unit wasn't working. Uh, for one reason was the power switch had been busted off. Uh, 
So I replaced the power switch with, with a much heavier unit. I don't think this one will bust off. And uh, when the power switch is in the off position, there's a standby light comes on which indicates that you are providing power to your ovenized crystal oscillator, if you have one. That is a, uh, another option. This is option 10. This unit ha happens to have that option and that puts in a, a precision um, Hewlett Packard uh, 10544A uh, ovenized crystal oscillator. This is a magnificent unit. And uh, we'll do a demonstration of that in a bit to explain uh, explain that. But that's kept on whether the unit is off or not, uh, and unless you unplug it. Um, the other option that this unit has is the HBIB control and uh, data interface. Uh, so you can pull the data out and control this unit um, remotely if you have an HPIB um, interface controller. I don't, I cannot test that board, but it's here and it doesn't seem to be inhibit the, uh, inhibiting the function of the unit. So right now, <clears throat> right now I'm, uh, I'm measuring a 10 megahertz signal coming in from this HP3320B and uh, and we're displaying 10 megahertz uh, fine. We, I can, uh, by changing my resolution switch, my gate time here, uh, I can see that I'm now picking up, I can change my sample rate too so we're holding a little longer. So now we're measuring 9,999,993 or 4 hertz and, uh, and I'm counting once every second. And I can go into a 10 second count if I want and pick up another uh, decade of accuracy. So we'll have more decimal places. So there we are to 3.9,999,993.4 hertz coming out of that uh, 3320 up there. And then if we go back around, uh, here's based on a, a uh, 1 megahertz uh, time base I'm getting a count of approximately 10 and if I go 0.1 megahertz then we got 10.0 and if I go to 10 kilohertz I've got 10.00 megahertz and then we just keep adding on additional uh, decades and we and notice that the enunciator changed from from megahertz so 10.000 megahertz to uh, 10,000.0 kilohertz. So the enunciator is working. The um, there are trigger level switches on channel A and B. If you have these knobs rotated until they click in the counterclockwise position, then you're in a preset mode. And essentially, you are looking at the zero crossing of the uh, uh, the signal coming in, and using that to trigger your channel. <clears throat> you may, though, um, <clears throat> you might be having a DC measurement, in which case your your signal might be writing on a on a DC envelope, and, and if it's writing high like that, then you never cross zero, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be uh, receiving a count. In that case, you would activate the trigger level, and you would dial it in until you saw the uh, the green light start blinking continuously. In which case, now you are measuring a signal. If it's not blinking, then you're not getting a count. If it is blinking, then you will count. Okay, and that works for both channel A and B. Um, we have, like I said, AC and DC coupling, switch, just switchable here. We have an attenu three position attenuator, uh, divide by 100, divide by 10, and 1. Right now I'm in the 10 mode. We can choose to tr trigger on the positive or negative slope. Um, the same thing goes for channel B. We have uh, Positive and negative slope, three position uh, attenuation, coupling AC or DC. 
and then we have the inputs. There's something else notice here that we have something called marker outputs. And these marker outputs uh, will output a signal that you would use on your z-axis of your oscilloscope and it would help you then highlight portions of a waveform that you're going to be working upon, uh, maybe measuring time intervals with. Um, there are uh, connectors in the, in the rear of the unit. And um, we have the gate output which we can use then to help synchronize uh, activities on our scope or other things. We have the uh, time base output. So we are looking at the internal time base. We can, we can see, um, see it come out. Um, we can choose to be internal or external on our time base, in which case we can feed in an external signal if we wish. Uh, we have a storage switch either on or off. We are in the off position right now and an arm control which is off or on. Arm uh, essentially uh, uh, if you were measuring burst packages of, uh, of signals you would arm and then you would and that would allow the uh, the initiation of the count to happen upon the uh, the sense of the moment that it senses the burst. If you don't have it armed and the trigger hasn't been adjusted that way, then uh, basically you initiate your cycle from your um, gate control. So uh, we're going to put this thing through its paces. It's in a really decent looking shape. We have nice, large, bright uh, LEDs, bright uh, annunciators. Uh, I've run this thing through all of its functions. It seems to work just fine. We're going to test a few of them here and demonstrate that. So bear with me. Okay, well I pulled the top off of this HP 5328A. And, uh, and I've got it running right now. just wanted to show you uh, the interior a little bit. And uh, what we have right here is... Uh, the high performance uh, crystal oscillator. It's uh, uh, an oven controlled crystal oscillator. I believe it's less than 5 times 10 to the minus 10th in drift per day. Um, we have an 8 digit um, rather large uh, LED display. And right now we are uh, counting. Uh, 506,587.857 hertz, which is coming from my uh, HP uh, 8640B, and we're feeding that into the um, uh, 5 to 512 megahertz channel C option, and it's, as you can see, it's working fine. Okay, well, I pulled the top off of this HP 5328A, and uh, and I've got it running right now. Just wanted to show you uh, the interior a little bit, and uh, what we have right here is uh, the high performance uh, crystal oscillator. It's uh, uh, an oven controlled crystal oscillator. I believe it's less than five times ten to the minus tenth. In drift per day. Um, we have an eight digit um, rather large uh, LED display and right now we are uh, counting uh, 506,587.857 hertz which is coming from my uh, HP uh, 8640B and we're feeding that into option 10 I believe it was the um, uh, 5 to 512 megahertz channel C option and it's as you can see it's working fine uh, I can change the um, uh, 
resolution so that we get a much faster count. We don't have to wait for it, and we could we could want if we want to slow down the sample rate. So we get a much better, easier way to read it. We have the uh, HP uh, IB interface board here, uh, so we have some control capability and. The HP IB interface card uh, gave you the capability to output data and control the unit uh, from the HP IB uh, interface bus. Uh, and you could interface this then with a slew of other equipment as well, collect the data. Um, we have uh, channel A and channel B, um, 0 to 100 megahertz for channel A. I'm not sure what B is. Let's check on that. Okay, well, uh, it's been approximately three years since this unit has even been plugged in. And uh, I want to check out the oscillator uh, frequency just to see how it's doing. And I thought I'd go ahead and make this part of the video. Right now I'm set up for frequency of A, and um, we can see we have the crystal oscillator back there. It's been warming up. It's been warming up overnight. And what I have here, this runs from my my master bench oscillator, which was rubidium cowled just recently. Very accurate, almost as accurate as the rubidium. Um, we're going to go ahead and plug this in. Okay, there we go. We see we're flashing, so we're acquiring the signal. And uh, right now she's counting up on a one second basis. And wow. So there's an extra count there 10 million even. Let's go ahead and put her in a 10 second cycle. We won't take the first count <coughs> as gospel. All right, looks like ten million point two. Ten million point two again. The one is shifted. We're we're actually cutting the one off, and we're getting the uh, an eight digits. We're showing the point two at the end. Well, it keeps repeating. That's like four times now we've gotten point two. So I just went back to the uh, one second interval, and we see ten million. That oscillator, that's really pretty spectacular. Um, it's It warmed up overnight, obviously. But in three years, like I say, it hasn't, uh, hasn't been plugged in. I haven't touched it, didn't calibrate it, and yet it's accurate to within two-tenths of a hertz. That's pretty nice. So that part's working. We'll try something else in a minute. Well, I was uh, so impressed with the way that that oscillator performed that I decided to go ahead and and literally connect this thing to the uh, rubidium source itself, not just my master. I want to try and alleviate all uh, all error source here, but that rubidium right now is warming up. We haven't achieved lock yet. We have a red light instead of a green light, so we're waiting. And uh, we're connected. We're counting. The rubidium right now is <coughs> It's uh, zeroing in on its signal. It started out low. It's running a little high right now. It's coming back down. It'll do this a couple of times, and then it'll lock on. When it locks, we're going to be uh, looking to see if we have, or just how close we have the 10 million hertz. Um, I did connect um, my Fluke to my uh, bench oscillator, and the Fluke is showing... Uh, 
one or two tenths low at this particular moment we're showing uh, two tenths low a few moments ago it was one so so between the two uh, counters there's four tenths difference so that, that's the reason why uh, I'm looking at, to see what the response is to the video we'll check them both out Okay, well, we have the green light on the rubidium, so we're in lock. And now uh, I want to take a look here and see how we're doing on this HP. And uh, we're in a one second count and we're getting 10 million. All right, let's go ahead and put her in a 10 second count and see what we get. Ten million will put the one off to the left. You won't be able to see the one. It'll, but we'll see to the right that we are two tenths high. There it is, two tenths high. So we got ten million point two hertz reading on the uh, on the HP, but we should have had ten million even. So the HP is two tenths high. Well, there's one tenth this time. Make a liar out of me. But that's in three years of non-use. And I'm not sure if I calibrated this thing three years ago. I might have, but don't know. But it's pretty amazing that she she just warmed up and came right back in there. It's it's showing one tenth high now. Tenth of a hertz. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that that oscillator is a good oscillator and that it's functioning well. It's, uh, that's, that's just remarkable. All right, we're going to continue on. I don't know why this camera is so sensitive to uh, the infrared, but it is. And anyway, uh, as you can see, we're still in the 10-second uh, calibration, or in the 10-second uh, gate time. And uh, we're getting 10 million. The one is off on the left, but we're getting 10 million to with better than a tenth of a hertz. So we've got all zeros all the way down. So we've calibrated to the rubidium. We adjusted the Lissajou pattern between the rubidium oscillator and the oscillator of the Hewlett-Packard so that we could get the uh, Lissajou pattern to stand pretty much still. That's our best way to calibrate. Uh, don't have to wait for the t update on the time. You can actually see the results. And the results are excellent. So, and if, if this thing is able to hold for the next three years like it did this time, then... Uh, it's going to be an excellent, excellent calibration. Okay, well, we've uh, calibrated the oscillator using the rubidium as our source, and we uh, used the Lissajou pattern. And uh, when we froze the Lissajou that compared the uh, rubidium to the oscillator internally to the Hewlett Packard, we knew we had it, and. Uh, so right now we're on a one second time base. We're looking at the rubidium coming in. We see we've got 10 meg. Let's go ahead and put her in a 10 second frame and we'll see what we get. Now what's going to happen in 10 seconds is the one's going to shift off to the left, uh, but we're going to pick up another decade to the right. And what we, so 10 million point zero. So we're within, we're within a tenth of a hertz such that we get all zeros now. So it accepted the cal really beautifully. I've switched cameras. This camera has a much more sensitivity to this red. So we're getting the display much better. Don't know what's the matter with the other one. But uh, the cal was successful. We're going to move on.
Okay, at this moment uh, I'm using channel C. I'm feeding in from this HP 8640B up here. I've got a 512 megahertz signal coming in. And 512 is the rated maximum of the channel C. And uh, right now I am on my least uh, uh, bit of resolution. I've got 512 to 513 showing up in megahertz. I can uh, change my resolution to expand it. I see I have 512.1, 512.01, 001. You always have one count that you can be off on your least significant digit here, but 512.0001, so we're, and that's in megahertz. There we've added four zeros and a one. We are five decades into 512, so let's go ahead and go to the one second uh, count. This is our maximum that we're going to be able to display the entire 512 million. So we see one, two, three, one. so we have 512 million and 16, 21, 25, 24. So, you get the idea. It's working fine. We're measuring the frequency fine. The, uh, the Hewlett Packard generator is only precise up to uh, two decade, two decimal places that we can count on. We're actually getting more out of it. We're getting four. So, not bad. Um, Let's go ahead and, uh, and go to different frequencies. This would be roughly 256. And let's uh, change our resolution so we get a little faster update. Here we are, roughly 128. 63, 64, 32. 16, 8, now we are supposedly below the, uh, the range of channel C, but we're still getting a reading 4, which is about right. But we would change our input from C to A, and then change our function to channel A. And we see we have 3,999,000, um, .95 kilohertz, which is 4 megahertz within, uh, within 50, 60 hertz. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and check channel A. We're supposed to be able to read up to 100. So let's give ourselves a hundred to read. All right. There is a hundred. We have ten thousand point zero two kilohertz which is 100 megahertz on channel A. Ten thousand kilohertz. Okay, let's uh, let's check A on the low end. I'm going to uh, remove myself from the 8640 and I'm going to plug myself in to the 3320, which is a lower frequency generator, and which at the moment still has 10 megahertz on it. And we're going to uh, reduce ourselves to 1 megahertz here. Okay. And Increase our resolution. All right, there's uh, 
1000.091 kilohertz, so 1 megahertz. Let's uh, step ourselves down. This would be uh, 1 100 kilohertz. And we are reading 100 kilohertz here in the enunciator. 10 kilohertz. 1 kilohertz. 100 hertz. 10 hertz. And 1 hertz. Now, we would go into a 10 second average, and we're going to wind up. Uh, getting a better read. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten hertz. One, two. So you see it's now the best this is the best we're able to do reading hertz directly in the low end. So a more effective way at this point of of getting better resolution would be to switch to a period measurement for for this low one hertz signal. The way to do that, we put ourselves into um, resolution where n is equal to one here, and we're going to go to a period measurement. And we are now in one second counting how many microseconds are able to get through the gate in one second, or well. How many microseconds get through the gate for the signal coming in on A, which is a 1 hertz rate, which is 1 second? So uh, we are counting 998,000, roughly 96 to 98,000. Um, we can change our resolution to uh, shorten up the count, and, uh, and we lose a little bit of the... Um, resolution doing that makes it a little bit easier to read though 999 1000 999 96 98 so that's working but you so you've got a whole lot more to work with here in terms of resolution than you did um, reading just one zero now since it's a repetitive function Something we can do is to go into a period average uh, for what's on A. So let's do that. All right. right now we're counting the uh, number of microseconds that get through in, uh, for every cycle that comes in on A, and we are, we are looking at um, at one period, so in, the, in this case one second. And we're getting roughly a hundred thousand, uh, excuse me, roughly a million of microseconds, 998,000. Now we could average over two periods, so two seconds, and we get a little bit better average. Let's change our sample rate here just to, we're going to tell it to hold that signal a little bit longer for us so we can see it. Nine hundred ninety-nine thousand seven hundred. Nine hundred ninety-nine thousand six hundred, and so on. Um, so you get a, a heck of a lot more in terms of resolution on that period measurement. Let's say we stepped our period up to something that's a little more interesting. Here's a here's a kilohertz. And um, we are in uh, uh, frequency resolution. The N is 1. So in a one-second count, we're getting roughly 1,000 microseconds. Now we're getting 
seven microseconds. We've added another decade of resolution here in terms of period. Uh, by going to 10 squared, we're getting 999,920 and so on. It takes a little bit longer uh, to average each step that you do this, but you get a little more accuracy on average. All right, let's uh, let's set ourselves up to do a ratio of B to A. We'll we'll do that in a moment. Okay, I've set myself up with a uh, 10 megahertz signal on channel B. I, uh, I'm in the preset point. I do see that I'm blinking. Channel A is uh, still connected to my HP 3320. We've got a uh, 1 kilohertz signal on that right at the moment. We have ourselves in the ratio of B to A mode. And... Uh, All right, so if you've got uh, 10 million over 1,000, that's 10 to the 7th over 10 cubed. And the result is 10 to the 4th, which is um, 10,000. So we are getting a ratio of 999, 9 and a fraction. So 10,000 is the ratio of A to B. With a slight adjustment of either, I could uh, I could take care of that difference. Let's uh, let's turn up um, the 3320 on channel A. Let's go to a um, hundred thousand, and we now have 99.99, or roughly a hundred, and that's because uh, 10 million over a hundred thousand is 10 to the seventh over 10 to the fifth, which is 10 squared, which is 100, and you got 100. All right. Here's uh, 1 megahertz coming in off of um, the 3320 on the channel A, and we now have a ratio of 10. Because channel B is 10 megahertz, we have 1 megahertz on A, we've got a ratio of A to B, or B to A of 10. So there we go. So the ratio is working fine. All right, uh, right now we're set up to measure the time interval from A to B. I've got a 1 megahertz signal coming in on channel A. I've pushed my, uh, my separate common switch down to the common uh, position, and so now both channels A and B are connected together. Uh, I have both in the preset point, so I'm getting blinking on both channels. Well, what I've done a little bit different here is that I said on channel B I want to trigger on the negative slope. In other words, what's coming in on channel A, uh, if it goes positive, um, I'm going to trigger channel A to start counting, but I'm not going to start triggering channel B until I see the negative slope of that pulse, of that waveform. So I'm going... I'm going to be counting for one half of the incoming frequency. I'll start as I as my incoming frequency starts to ramp up. I'll trigger the uh, channel A. I'll start counting. But when I start to fall in the negative direction, that's when channel B gets triggered, and I stop counting. Not only so that it takes place in just a half of the incoming frequency. So my incoming frequency is a megahertz which would be one microsecond and right now what I'm seeing is 0.5 microseconds which is correct one half of one microsecond is 0.5 microseconds so I am counting the time interval for me to be properly now since this is repetitive I can switch myself to the time average function for A to B and I can increase my resolution by now turning my my frequency resolution dial to say the 10 position and I've added another decade of resolution to it and I see 0 0.50 to 0 0.51 let's do it again so 0 0.500 0 0.50 
0 0.500 0 0.500 so we're measuring the average over multiple um, periods this way and then able to display an additional decimal place so the time intervals are working fine too if if you really to me using the time intervals for anything else would require a little bit of digital logic work you would want to be able to produce a positive start pulse and hold it for channel A to start counting and then whatever is going to trigger the end of the event you want to uh, provide a positive pulse to channel B to turn it off do that and you'll be able to measure any phys the time period between any physical uh, happening in the world here so essentially I've taken you through most everything let's uh, uh, let's take a look at um, at the check function okay and we'll start ourselves out here and okay so now we applying we're in check mode and maybe when I first turn my unit on I'm curious if I'm, everything's working okay I'm applying a 10 megahertz signal uh, into check mode and I'm dividing by 1 megahertz and I get a result of 10 and uh, that's megahertz on the uh, enunciator and if I dial up to uh, 0.1 megahertz gate time I pick up another decade and another decimal point and I've got 10.0 megahertz do it again I've got zero zero triple zero four zeros five zeros six zeros I'm actually seeing the count happen now and then finally in the point one Hertz mode or 10 second mode I, uh, I get my maximum display and I'm actually going to be f forcing the one off of the screen but I'm I show that I'm all zeros all the way down to the tenth of a Hertz So I'm working. The sample rate uh, changes how frequently you update the count here. Allow it to update. If you have it too fast, then it never holds a count for you. Like in this case, I, uh, I, all I see is it counting all the time. So in this case, I want to uh, I want to change the sample rate so that it holds the the end display longer for me, and I realize what the count is. Okay, let's uh, move on. Okay, well, the final thing I wanted to try and show was the marker outputs. So we've got cables coming from the marker outputs going up to my scope. I have uh, channel A showing the marker output here, and channel B I've got down below. What I have uh, from channel A is the 1 megahertz frequency that's coming through here. So what happens is, as, um, as channel A swings through this negative portion of the cycle here, uh, I'm showing that my marker goes high, and, th and that means that I've, on channel A, I have started counting. And then we count throughout the, the cycle until we start to reverse, and we, we do the top part of the, of the wave, at which point channel B triggers and we stop counting. And the results for a 1 megahertz input is that we have 500 nanoseconds which would be half of the wave time uh, displayed. 1000 uh, nanoseconds would be uh, a megahertz but if we're only counting for half of the wave, then we get 500. So that gives you an idea what the marker looks like. So I'm going to put the thing back together and we'll, uh, we'll talk a little further. Well, I nearly forgot to demonstrate the totalizer uh, counting our events here. What I have happening right now is um, on channel A, I have a very slow signal coming in from my HP 
3320 over here, I've got a 1 hertz signal coming in. And um, we can see our, our levels were in preset and our light is blinking, so we are seeing the count. I have myself in, in the start of A position. And you can see that I'm tallying up the counts. If I reset it, we'll start over again. And if I turn up the frequency, like if we go to 10 hertz, and if we go to 100, doesn't matter. Now you can stop the count moving to the next position. Resume the count. Stop. Resume. So the totalizer is working too. Just wanted to be able to demonstrate that. Okay, well we have this unit put back together. And uh, give you just a quick uh, quick look at it. We've got the carrying strap on the side still, in, uh, still intact. The feet on the bottom for the front, they're in place. No major scratches or marks. We saw the rear earlier in the, uh, in the video. I'll uh, attempt to give you a look underneath here. No surprises. So it's a fine unit. It's a uh, milestone probably in the uh, evolution of these counters. And uh, with that, I'm going to say goodbye and wish you good bidding. And uh, we'll see you again on our next uh, project. Thank you.